Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Watkin Jones PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll, and if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand you over to CEO Richard Simpson. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to uh, this uh, presentation um, on our annual results, uh, which finished um, uh, on the 30th of September 2022. Uh, as I've already been introduced, but but um, no harm double tapping. My name is Richard Simpson. I'm the chief executive and I'm supported by Sarah Sargent, uh, the chief financial officer. What we're going to do is we're going to run you through uh, a few slides which look at our financial performance um, for that for that financial year. And we'll also endeavour to bring you up to date to the situation, um, the trading uh, situation, operating situation, uh, which we uh, find ourselves in at at the moment um, i would imagine the um this review of the uh, pack will take between sort of 30 to 35 minutes and therefore we're leaving plenty of time uh, for q a at, at the end which i think is is really what this is about to hear your thoughts hear your questions and give us an opportunity to respond to to those as best we can so turning to the presentation then, uh, the agenda is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we'll look at the summary for uh, our financial year 22. We'll then do a little bit of a deeper dive into the numbers themselves. And we'll then turn to the outlook and thinking about the development market and the market, the underlying market for student accommodation and also build to rent. Uh, before finishing up by thinking a little bit about uh, ESG, our approach at the moment, um, and also uh, how fresh our property management business uh, is getting on. As I say, we will finish up uh, with plenty of time for Q&A. So for, therefore, turning to the first one in terms of the outlook and summary, I think the best way to characterise FY22 that is um, resilient and adaptable in the first 11 months uh, during that period of time, I think the business coped well with uh, a fair bit of volatility, bill cost inflation, um, movement within asset prices, uh, but fundamentally a very strong demand for build to rent and purpose built student accommodation uh, from, from the investment uh, universe. And then, of course, month 12 uh, really surrounded or uh, revolved around the mini budgets. And that's where we had two planned forward sales that were actually very, very well advanced and uh, got caught up in the teeth of the storm there. And both of the purchasers decided to pull out, uh, citing material uncertainty at the time. But in terms of um, outlook, we have uh, 700 million uh, pounds worth of forward sold revenue to come over, over the next few years. And of course, that's forward sold because of uh, the sales we made principally last year and the year before and therefore just the time it takes to develop those properties out we have that revenue contractually secure so that's very important but we also have um, 800 million circa 800 million of revenue to come on consented pipeline principally for student accommodation consents which we are now actively marketing um, out there and I think one of the interesting characteristics here would be that we expect uh, forward sales to resume in our H2 and so very much see that being second half, second half weighted. There's a few comments on there about margins, but I won't, I won't pick those up now because I know Sarah is going to come to those in a second. So just turn, turning over to FY22 results, I'm going to hand over to Sarah. Great. Thank you, Richard. I'll just do a, a quick overview of our results for the financial year ending September 22. So overall, 
I'm pleased to report the results were in line with the update that we did to the market at the beginning of October. Um, we had revenue of, of just over 407 million, representing a very small decline from the prior year position. And this is really due to the impact of the two forward sales that Richard has talked about, which didn't close as we had intended in September. Our gross margin was at 16.6%, again, very slightly uh, less than the prior year impact of the higher level of land sales that we had in the prior year. We take these to revenue at a lower margin than we do the following development works. We had operating profit at just under 55 million. That included uh, a profit on disposal from the sale of two student assets, which we were holding on, under, uh, holding on our balance sheet. Obviously, everything then flowed through to, to EPS. Um, EPS was slightly down on the prior year. We did have a small impact from a prior year tax adjustment in relation to some remedial works which were disallowed. Pleased to report a, a dividend of, of, of 4.5 pence, which we paid to shareholders very shortly. Um, and we had Rocky at 63%, um, again, slightly down on the prior year, but obviously still represents a, a very, very strong position. I think there's one key point on these slides is that they are uh, reported on an underlying basis. This excludes the exceptional charge of, of 30 million we took in the year for our provision of works to be done um, in relation to the Building Safety Act. Just following on to, to balance sheet, um, the key points here are really the, the strong gross and net cash position that we finished at, at the year end. Um, as I said, we have disposed of two of our leased assets and therefore you see a corresponding reduction in the, uh, the asset value and also the liability value for those. I think finally, we, we did have a level of build up on our balance sheet. This was in relation to a couple of pieces of land that, that, that we acquired. And indeed, there's one site in, in Bristol, a very, very strong quality um, student scheme, which we are building out where we have the, uh, a lease to the University of Bristol. From, from a cash flow perspective, that, that really represents, the, the, the outflow represents that, that build-up of, of land and working progress, progress that I've, I've just referred to. We obviously also had a corresponding increase in borrowings as we drew down on our, um, on our credit facility in relation to the purchase of these pieces of land. But overall, as, as, as we look forward and we look into uh, 23, you can see a strong liquidity position with, with our gross cash and with our available facilities. From a segmental perspective, and, and, and this slide here shows the breakdown of, of, of revenue between the different segments of, of, of our business, I think the key point is really to point out that growing contribution from, from build to rent. So you can see we recorded revenue of 191 million um, for build to rent. That represents a 68%, in, sorry, that represents a 38% in, in increase. Um, I think the only other really key, key point here is, is, is Fresh, that's our accommodation management business, had a record year of revenue, record revenue of just over 9 million. Just moving on to, to gross profit, so in terms of our segmental gross profit, um, we recorded a margin of 17.2% 17 .7, 17 for, for BTR. Um, that's very strong and, and obviously ahead of our tar target margin of 15%. And as Richard said, I'll come on and talk about the guidance that we're giving for margin um, uh, for 23 and 24 in a couple of slides time. Um, I think the other, other kind of key point here is, is, is fresh, um, really good increase in the gross margin there to 65%. And that's due to the level of occupancy that's increased in the student buildings that, uh, that fresh manages. And just the, the final slide from a, from a um, numbers perspective. Um, Given the, 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 the position that we thought we would be in at the half year and then the subsequent update that we gave to the market at the beginning of October, 
I thought it was important to to give a bridge from where we thought we were going to be to obviously that that four year delivery of fifty five million operating profit um, at the half year. And, and as Richard said, we, we did have confidence in achievement of our four four year number, and obviously that was you know it's quite significantly impacted by events in in, in September. Um, you can see here that, that the building blocks, um, so, so if you look to the, the right hand side of the table, um, you can see that the impact in, in yellow from the delay of the two forward sales. So we had one forward sale in, in Bristol and, and one in Belfast, those were pulled and you can see the corresponding increase on our, on, on our profit. We did also experience some margin pressure on the last forward sales, which we did um, complete in, in H2. But, but equally, we had a, um, a, a strong profit from the disposal of the two lease, lease assets and obviously then managed to mitigate some of that some of that position to result in the 55 million operating profit. I'll now turn to talk a little bit more about 23, uh, what we're seeing, and then equally the outlook that we've given to the market, both on revenue and margin. So in terms of, of, of 23, we're guiding to a, a revenue number of about 550 million for this financial year. Financial year. And this assumes that, that the forward fund market will return to more normal demand levels in, in Q2. So that, that put it to the note that that's Q, Q2 of the calendar year, not Q2 of our, of, of our financial year. That the top table really shows the building blocks to that revenue forecast. You can see in green, uh, this is a revenue that we've already forward sold. Um, that's on site, um, con contractually secure and being built out at the moment. The balance of, of, of the revenue, so that's 250 million, it comes from new forward sales where we have um, a very, very strong secured by pipeline, as Richard said, that, that has an overall revenue value, about 700 million. Um, and obviously, we've got assumption of forward sales elements coming through there. It, it, I guess it's key to note here that we aren't assuming any of those forward sales happen until the second half of, of, of our year. I think the other point is that we've presumed that there'll be very little um, construction revenue in relation to these forward sales. It will just be the land element, and therefore that gives us a little bit of flexibility about the, the, the timing of that. From a profit perspective, we're, we're guiding to an operating profit of, of, of similar to financial year 22. So that's about 55 million. And, and it's key to note that that does assume prudent in investment evaluations um, with obviously a, a reduction in the, in the selling price. And that's obviously in line with some of the um, forward sales that we completed in the second half of financial year 22. Um, our cash flow will, will follow its normal um, annual um, profile, which is where we, we spend down on, on cash during the course of the year from a working capital perspective, obviously to, to finance our overheads, tax, dividends and interest, and then rebuilds as we come into the, um, into the end of the financial year um, as we complete the new forward sales. I think finally the other key point on and, and this slide is we have taken the decision just to slow down our affordable led housing business really as a result of the, the, the state of the market. We felt it was important to probably stick to the knitting um, while we focus on the recovery of the more established and equally the higher margin student and BTR sectors of our business. And just to give a bit more colour um, on the high on the on our consented pipeline, as we said, that that this accords to total revenue of about eight hundred million. Um, we can that this that's about um, eight schemes in total. Very very quality assets, and yeah, you know, I think one advantage of of us not not completing any forward sales in in the last few months is that we've been really built to 
work on this pipeline, bring, bring it through planning and indeed get planning permission. And, and it's a very strong base for, for us as we look into look, in, look, look into 23. I mean, just a couple of examples. We've got a fantastic student scheme in, in, in Stratford, a really, really great location. And I think many of you are aware that um, Stratford as a, as, as a place has had such a significant rejuvenation um, since the Olympics in, in, in 2012. And again, very rare to get planning in such a, in such a sought after location. Um, I think we've got a similar uh, similar scheme in, in, in Bristol. We've got a number of um, uh, student schemes which are coming through. And I guess it's key there because we have a the city as itself has a real, real shortage of um, student accommodation and equally of student accommodation, which is coming online in, in, in the next couple of years. So overall, very, very strong consented pipeline, which we are um, out in the market with at the moment. Just, just a little bit on, on on cost. Obviously, as we as we faced into the um, and the market, and obviously kind of on back of the trading update that we gave at the beginning of, of October, it was important to make sure that our business was 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 fit for the future as as, as we came into slightly more in, in, in certain times. And um, we conducted a very very quick uh, um, review and, and and cost out program. So we took out about forty heads. That's about 10% of the Watkin Jones workforce, excluding fresh. Um, this will give us annualized savings of about three to four million. And obviously those savings are starting to come through now as, as everybody uh, impacted left the business before um, before Christmas. I think the key point here is 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 the cost was was mainly um, or or the people out was was mainly in the su support functions. Um, we were obviously very keen to make sure we protected the the development and the divestment teams, which are so integral to the future um, success of the business going forwards. And just looking forward to, to, to gross margin. So, so we are guiding to a, a blended gross margin of 12 to 14 percent for the next couple of years. Um, I guess that the, the key factors behind that are firstly the impact of the price reductions on what we already have forward sold and, and in the second half of, 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 of last year. Um, we've obviously made, we've obviously kind of kept those valuations um, in, intact as, as we've gone through the pipeline. Um, the third point is this: this pipeline is in, pipeline is in relation to land at, at historical prices. So I think you're aware that we we hold very little land on our balance sheet, but we do hold it under option and therefore we have a contractually committed price to to to, to work through the land. Um, and then finally, we have a small impact from, from development wrap projects. These are projects we do. For example, we're doing one for LNG in Cardiff at the moment, um, which do come at through at lower margin because we don't hold any in, in interest in land. So those are effectively the, the drivers behind having a, a slightly lower blended gross margin. As we look forward, we very much see a, a route to, to recover our margins. And that's really um, as we get a better price on land and we are seeing land valuations come down five, five to 10 percent. On eco, we see the opportunity to, to rebuild the margin um, as, as build costs start to start to uh, decrease. And you're all aware it's been a very, very um, strong inflationary year for build costs in, in the last year or so. Already we're seeing that inflation number coming down, not yet to deflation, but we expect that to start moderating as we, as we go forwards. And, and then finally, just a kind of summary of, of the resilience of, of the business. Um, as Rich said, we have very good visibility of, of secured revenue. We've got 700 million, which is forward sold, and that will come through over the next uh, one to two years, um, of which approximately half will be in, in, in FY23. A secured development pipeline, um, which is held at, at realistic values. We've taken out a, a couple of sites which were unprofitable. Um, we have a very strong capital light model. Um, we are, because of that capital light, we hold very little on our balance sheet and, and therefore we're not exposed to, to significant asset devaluation um, in, in, in a downturn. 
And our model is is generally, we've got one exception at the moment, but it's generally not to start on site with a, without a forward funding deal in place. And, and from a liquidity perspective, you know, a good, strong uh, cash balance that we that we finished at the year end and, and obviously sufficient or significant headroom on our RCF facility, which will allow us to take advantage of attractive land acquisitions as we look in the opportunity in the market. So on that note, I'll hand over to Richard, who's just going to talk a little bit more about the progress we've made in development. Thank you very much, Sarah. So um, as Sarah was talking about there, there is clearly volatility at the moment and there is some uncertainty about valuations and pricing and certainly the outlook for, for those. So as a developer, what are we doing to try and get in front of that? Well, it's already come out that uh, despite having uh, a secured uh, development pipeline where the land price is fixed within the contracts. Clearly, outside of the contract, we can go back and proactively have discussions with uh, vendors about potentially reducing those those prices. Now, they don't commercially well; they don't contractually have to um, budge an inch, but but commercially, uh, that they, they might seek to um, agree a discount in order to have more certainty that we would go ahead and transact on the land. And certainly, those are. Those, are, those discussions are ongoing, but equally where we're looking at the next wave of development pipeline, sort of new acquisitions in the market, uh, it is a pretty attractive market at the moment and the sort of bearish sentiment which, which persists uh, it, it is definitely leading to a reduction in land price. And we shouldn't forget that most of the land we buy are in town and city centres and other uh, competitors for that land would typically be commercial developers or maybe retail developers or maybe even hoteliers. And uh, all of those markets are pretty depressed at the moment. So we do see good opportunities uh, at, at attractive margins, certainly back to our historic margins uh, going forward. In terms of planning, we are looking to work with the local planning authority to tweak our uh, planning permissions and look to maximise density and thereby uh, maximise the value on them and there is recent examples where we've had discussions successfully with local planning authorities about putting an amended application in where we can perhaps get an extra floor um, that can make a, a a pretty material difference to the value um, of the development itself and cer certainly can look to offset some of the drop in overall value uh, which um, which we have been experiencing within the residential sector and then we've got the rent and operations i mean we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the key, the key hook for institutional investors to buy assets from us is exposure to the underlying residential sector in the UK. And of course, that has been characterised over the last few years as being really strong occupancy and very strong rental growth. Clearly, all of us are aware because it is far from the it, 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 it's, it's, it's seldom far from the news as to um, annualise rental growth within residential at the moment, it, it is strong. And of course, it's attractive, therefore, for owners of those assets. And therefore, it's attractive to institutions to talk to us about forward purchasing our development pipeline. Um, and then Sarah's already covered bill costs here, but clearly the key the key point for us is that we, uh, we are seeing a reduction in the rate of inflation. Um, in, as she says, not yet negative, but we expect actually materials potentially to go negative over the course of this year. Labour's stickier, but nonetheless, I think there is also scope for, scope for labour prices to come down too. So we'll turn um, a little bit more into um, the colour of some of the points I've already made. And we can see here with the land side of things, land prices historically... Um, historically lags the market um, but we are we are already seeing um, land prices come down and we're already engaging with landowners about securing uh, our, our next wave of development sites as I say at, at those discounts which which help to contribute back to our um, historical targeted margins um, planning again these comments I've, I've already made um, we've had a good we've had a good Good run actually over the last few years on planning. We we without trying to tempt fate, we tend to get our planning permissions. Uh, various reasons for it, but I think 
I imagine uh, one of those reasons is that uh, we we look in town and city centres and one of the very few places where there is quite clear government support and planning, it is exactly in those locations because they are looking to regenerate and breathe life back into those parts of towns and cities which otherwise perhaps have gone a bit quiet over the last few years. Um, and I think that is a that is a sort of fairly reasonable tailwind for us as a business as we look to go forward. Perhaps have a little bit more visibility and confidence around planning than uh, a number of other developers out there. I think the other uh, part is that we've got a good long long term track record in in not just securing planning but then implementing and developing in a timely manner our developments. And we have um, a, a very large number of completed developments all over the UK where they are um, an important part of the local community, there are tenants, there are residents, they're being managed responsibly, uh, and all of that is, is important when we then come back with a new planning application and that local authority is well aware of us from our previous work. Um, as I say, it, it, it's, it's all part of our brand. And then this point on bill costs, again, which I've already covered, but there's just a little bit more detail there, there for you. Um, but as I say, I think I think the key point here is that we are seeing bill cost inflation uh, reduce. And this this slide and the next one actually look at a little bit about what happened in September. And really what this slide tries to pull out is um, a comparison of the risk free rate to uh, residential yields. And you can see that the risk free rate is essentially the two the two lines at the bottom and residential yields are, is the purple or dark blue line at the top. And you can see how to, um, over the autumn of last year, how that how that uh, that gap closed materially. Um, and of course, it is it is about the uh, extra return investors get for for investing in residential as opposed to just investing in gilts, uh, which is important um, for them to think about investing in our in our sectors in the asset classes and of course what's really important it's not just a straight comparison of of yield to yield i.e the net initial yield you, you might generate from student or btr compared to the risk-free rate but you also need to add in rental growth because rental growth is an important part of total property return and what you can see here shown in a number of different ways uh, for completeness is that if you take the net initial yield of residential and you and, and you add on rental growth, then that is giving a a pretty material and attractive premium uh, to the risk free rate, and uh, and therefore um, the maths are working for institutional investors to look to continue to buy uh, product from us, and that is why we expect the market for forward sales um, to return over the course of this financial year. Then just turning to the market review, uh, overall we're seeing a strong growth in demand from um, uh, prospective students to come and study at UK universities. You can see a number of data points there, but essentially we are seeing um, a pretty robust supply demand imbalance. The, a very simple way to analyse it is that there's around 2 million full-time students in the UK and there's uh, just under 700,000 purpose-built student accommodation beds either owned by universities or corporately provided um, which which shows a, a pretty material gap and therefore um, good scope to continue to increase uh, supply within that market. And similarly when we turn to build to rent we can see that um, occupancy has been extremely strong which is driven uh, very attractive rental growth and actually projections looking forward are are to are to remain strong even though the expectation of course is for uh, broader inflation to begin to subside and therefore that is more about uh, lack of supply uh, and therefore fundamental demand dri driving up occupancy and pricing and then it's interesting even though we are going through this period of volatility i think i think really what's happened over the last certainly the last few years but if we bring it forward to what's happened in the last few months is uh, residential demand from tenants has remained elevated and as i say therefore there's strong occupancy therefore there's strong rental growth and actually if you compare that to almost any other part of 
uh, real estate you can look at commercial more traditional commercial sectors perhaps you, you certainly wouldn't wouldn't have seen that level of performance or or that level of confidence about about the future performance either and so what we're certainly seeing is that increasingly institutional investors are looking to recycle out of more traditional real estate into the residential sector now the only real way for institutional investors to access residential to get exposure is through student accommodation and it is through multifamily build to rent so we do we do expect over the medium to long term once we're through this volatility uh, for very strong demand uh, to to re-establish and in fact continue to grow from those institutional investors. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah to look at Fresh. Thank you, Richard. So just a, a very quick update on Fresh. Um, I think you're aware Fresh is our accommodation management platform, um, which operates predominantly in the student space, but, but moving more into the BTR space. Very strong operation expertise. So we have over 23,000 uh, units or, or beds under management across the UK and Ireland at the moment. Um, very successful from a retention perspective. So retention rates of, of, of 98%. Um, Fresh continues to um, be market leading and get fantastic feedback both from clients um, uh, and, and from, from residents alike and you can see on the slide just some of the great examples of the awards that Fresh has, has, has won this year. Um, from an investment perspective, um, you know, we have continued to invest in Fresh and we see it very, very much as a, a, an important part of our business. Um, we've established a, a new leadership team with some excellent e expertise in it. Uh, we've also done a, 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 a systems update and we've got a, a, a program, a platform in called, called Yardi, which, which effectively gives both clients and, and, and residents alike access to all the information they need in, in, in relation to, to, to the scheme. And then looking forward, uh, we really see um, great growth opportunities for, for Fresh. As, as I said, we see it very much moving in, into the BTR um, arena. It has a, a number of BTR sites that it manages at the moment and many more in, in the pipeline. And, you know, there we would look at doing a, a white label offer, for, for example, where potentially the Fresh brand might not be, uh, might not, might, might not be appropriate. So, very, very, very pleased with Fresh. You know, it's, it, it's always offered um, very qualitative benefits to, to the Watkin Jones business. Obviously, it kind of in, in, enables us to be able to offer an end-to-end an -end solution to, to our clients in terms of uh, delivering a scheme, which we then go on to uh, go on to manage. But equally qualitative, so Fresh has a very strong gross margin, as, as we've seen earlier in the slides. And if I think about the margin guidance that I gave previously, that was just for BTR and, and, and for student. If we can add another percentage point on, on, on gross margin in, in relation to Fresh. So in summary, a great business and, and, and really looking forward to supporting it um, as we look into this year. I'm now going to hand back quickly to Richard. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, so in terms of the ESG, as you know, we've got our Future Foundations um, strategy here for ESG, which picks up planet uh, places and people. And you can see just a very short summary of some of the uh, achievements or some of the things which we've been working on over the course of last year. I think it's it's fair to say that uh, just like many companies, it's still relatively early days for us in terms of our ESG strategies, but I think we're making initial progress in line with what we'd look to do. I think perhaps for me, the key one is is around scope three emissions, because that's where that's really your, your supply chain's carbon footprint. And it's about how do you how do you sort of in, how do you change behaviours appropriately and how do you change um, your methods of procurement, the materials you use and the ways in which you uh, physically undertake construction on site to reduce that carbon footprint and I think that's an important um, point for us to look to make further progress on um, it, it is it is equally probably the one of the most difficult challenges within a sort of ESG uh, plan so certainly for a uh, real estate developer uh, where as I say the majority of the carbon footprint really comes from our supply chain now the way to move into that is to start by benchmarking where we are today 
and that's why we're working with uh, an organization called science based targets and that is one of our main targets for this year and what, what that will effectively do is quantify our carbon footprint across the business into our supply chain as well once we have that baseline that is a great starting point we can then see what our sensible targets um, to, to really aim at and really work with our supply chain to achieve and then we can push quite hard into those areas but otherwise you can see that we have um, within our places uh, area is all about the sustainability of the buildings we build use of air source heat pumps making sure that all of the buildings are not just um, the smart thinking has gone into how we build them but then also how how they can be operated uh, long term downstream post construction efficiently and sustainably so i will move forward to leveraging our strengths this really is a slide where we are um, thinking about uh, possible ways to improve the business and there are a number of uh, potential areas which, which we are we are sort of working through at the moment as a board and really as i say the, the main the, the main aim of this is just to have a, a better more resilient business and then presumably that that would uh, that would have a stronger rating on the stock market but i think the key point to make on this is that we really believe in the ford fund capital light uh, uh, high rocky model and we see that as remaining core so then turning to the summary um quite, quite a bit's been covered in the last 35 minutes and i don't intend to summarize all of it but i think what we've seen is that um over the course of last year actually a very strong 11 twelfths um and across the operational side on all areas from securing land securing planning undertaking development forward selling well managing bill cost inflation uh, proceeded well and it was really in that 12th month where two of the planned sales um, fell over uh, which led to um, our update in october in terms of our performance and where we're looking into the current market uh, we're still experiencing volatility as is everybody but we are seeing uh, those early green shoots of institutional investors coming back to look at the circa 800 million of the consented pipeline which we have for sale um, really spending time having signed non-disclosure agreements getting into data rooms doing due diligence on them beginning to talk about pricing uh, which continues to give us confidence that we will resume uh, forward selling uh, in our financial age too um, and and I, I think longer term the outlook for institutional investors investing in the residential for rent or the living sector remains incredibly robust it probably is the most attractive part of uk real estate and therefore we would expect significant volumes of institutional investor capital to continue to flow into the sector and clearly as market leader of student accommodation and btr multifamily development uh, we, we would expect to be at the front of the at the front of the queue there for that capital so that concludes uh, the formal part of the presentation and we can now turn to q a richard sarah that's great and thank you very much indeed for your presentation this afternoon um ladies and gentlemen please do continue to submit your questions just by using the q a tab that's situated on the top right hand corner of your screen uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already i would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published q a can be accessed via your investor dashboard um sarah richard we obviously received a number of pre-submitted questions ahead of today's event um and as you can see there in the Q&A tab we've also received a number of questions throughout your presentation this afternoon as well um, so firstly thank you to all of those on the call for taking the time to submit their questions um, and Richard sir if I could just hand back to you to respond to those where it's appropriate to do so and then I'll pick up from you at the end thank you perfect thank you very much indeed so let me just turn to the first question here um, and I think Sarah can probably put, pick this one up so let, let, let me pose it for her um, for the two sales that didn't happen last year, have the buyers completely gone away or are you back in discussions with them? If not, how are the sales discussions progressing? 
Yeah, no, of course. Thanks, Richard. So in, in terms of those two sales, um, they are obviously still very much part of that consented pipeline that, that I took you through in, in the slides. Um, in relation to one of them, that the, the, the previous buyer is, is, is back in negotiation with us, um, which is very positive um, in, in terms of, of market sentiment. Um, the other one ha has gone away, but we are obviously um, have a lot of interest coming through um, from other parties in relation to that asset. And as, 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 as Richard said, you know, we've obviously got a significant number of investors um, in the data rooms, having signed DAs and obviously looking across the whole portfolio. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. And I think there's... Um... Another good question has come in, which perhaps I can just pose for yourself, uh, which is really saying, what are the top three risks? Perhaps they don't have to be three risks, but what are the top risks that could stop you hitting the 2023 outlook? Yeah, and no, of course, and and I think there's probably really one significant risk, and and that's all that that is that our assumptions um, on that forward sale market. Um, uh, returning not, not happening um i think i set out in, in in that bridge the level of revenue and profit dependency from us having to complete forward sales in in the second half of, of the year um as i said we have really just assumed that the land element of of, of the forward sale and therefore you know, gives us a little bit of flexibility of timing but there is still a, a, a you know, obviously a, a, a significant dependency on the market reopening and and, and on us being able to complete those sales um in, 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 in the six months and to, to the to the end of September. Um but but as again as you know Richard as as, as alluded to, we are seeing very great levels of interest at, at the moment and really kind of continuing to work through all the processes is that we need to to get those sales through. Um, I, th I think yeah, probably a, a key point is is that internally we we've obviously done a lot of work to to get these um, um, what's well, you know fit for purpose, um, ready to be forward sold, oven ready, and obviously working with our lawyers and our other advisors to, to make sure we can make that process as as smooth as smooth as possible. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. I'll I'll pick up the next one, which is um, what is the typical net income yield that your BTR developments offer to investors? So I'd say um, income yield clearly varies across the UK, but a blended average is probably around four and a quarter percent. It's around that sort of level. That would be the net initial yield. And of course, as we looked at that slide just a few minutes ago, the best way to look at total, well, the best way to look at property return is to um, take your net initial yield and you add to that your rental growth. So rental growth for residential at the moment across the UK is at elevated levels. Uh, I've seen some cities which are quoting double digit annualised growth. Now, I don't think any investor would look to bake in that sort of level for very long. But nonetheless, if you were to potentially put into your model, maybe 4%, something like that, the next few years perhaps then trending down to three percent i think that would be relatively prudent and of course what what that would give you is comfortably a a total a, an ungeared total return in the sevens potentially even um slightly higher into the eights and of course when you put this when you compare that as a spread to the risk-free rate you know that gilts are i mean they are fluctuating but but gilts short to long are somewhere in the threes to the low fours that is probably an attractive spread. So, Sarah, if I can, if I can pose you this question that's come in, which is, how is, how is the cost inflation in labour and construction materials impacting your business? Yeah, no, of course. Thanks, Richard. So, so our our forward sold forward sold model means that when we complete a, a forward sale we also secure and lock in our procurement packages 
at the same time. So, so we obviously do that by working through with our subcontractors and getting a price for the packages in terms of to, to, for them to be able to build out the development. So at the point of that, that forward sale, we obviously have full um, visibility of, of revenue and also full visibility of, of costs and, and therefore full visibility of our margin. Um, we obviously also, when we're going through the uh, uh, the numbers on the development, would, would build in a level of inflation for, 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 for build costs. Um, historically, so last year, that would have been between 7 and 8%. We're obviously now looking at lower inflation levels, and I said kind of 2 3%. So, you know, our, our model allows us to protect to protect against bill cost inflation as we look forward. And as I set out in our in our in that kind of blocks to rebuilding the margin, we would like to see that there will be some incremental benefit to come through as we're procuring at the moment, um, where we think there has been a, a decline in, 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 in build cost inflation. Um, as, as Richard said, we're expecting that um, to come through from a materials, we still think, given some of the the pressures on on, on the UK economy, that that the labour piece will be will be uh, will be sticky. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Let me pick up the next one, which is build to rent, student accommodation, or affordable homes. Where do you see the greatest upside? I think at the moment we're seeing um, strongest appetite, greatest potential liquidity within student accommodation. Uh, and so given the fact that our highest margin development is also student accommodation, then this is an area which we are going to be um, just focusing on um, a little bit more strongly. We still firmly believe in build to rent, multifamily, very significant addressable market. And I think it will continue to be a very important part of the growth of the company over the, over the coming years. Um, and then, uh, as Sarah flagged just a few minutes ago, on the affordable housing side, we do really believe in it. But seeing as it's a relatively new part of our business, and clearly we are going through volatility at the moment, we are just pausing to some extent our, our sort of plans, aspirations for this part until we're safely through the volatility. And then potentially, um, well, we certainly will then revisit exactly what, what we're looking to do next there. Um, there's another question about who are your competitors and how have they fared in this environment? Is it a buyer's market for institutional investors? So in terms of competitors, it's difficult to characterise exactly who, who they are. Uh, principally, for, from a development point of view, there would be your SME developers with regional biases and regional focuses and regional areas of expertise. They are very heavily uh, bank debt uh, dependent and therefore have been extremely quiet recently. But equally, as I mentioned earlier, we tend to buy land in town and city centres. So we have come up and we do come up against hoteliers and commercial developers and so on. But again, they're very quiet at the moment. I think they will be actually for quite some time. And uh, which does give us a, a very interesting opportunity. And then the final bucket of com competitors are probably the REITs. So the student REITs and um, I'd say the BTR REITs, there's, uh, there's obviously Granger, which is intending to convert, but I, I already sort of think of them as a REIT. Um, and all of those businesses have, have expressed um, quite a high degree of caution about their development programme at the moment, and understandably so, because their core business is their operational platform. And, and, and um, that, needs, that needs all the sort of care and attention uh, they can they can provide and discretionary activities such as development understandably take a bit of a back seat so i think i think in some what that does is it does create good opportunities for us to go and secure attractive land at competitive prices uh, to really sort of build up that that next wave of our development pipeline and then the final point is, is it a buyer's market for institutional investors I, I mean i think you have to say at the moment the um the market's tilted in favor of the buyer and we know that markets move and evolve. So we expect that to continue um, for a period of time through this volatility. That's why Sarah said we've been pretty prudent as to the sales values, which which we think we can achieve for our, ne our next wave of consented forward sales. But then of course, as the market normalizes, 
my my strong view would be that um, there is real scarcity value in consented student accommodation and consented BTR schemes across the UK, and therefore a lot of competitive tension from bidders tends to tilt it back firmly uh, in favour of the seller. It's worth bearing in mind actually being able to secure planning is is really not that straightforward. Uh, and in fact, it, it kind of leads me on to the next question, which which let me read out and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about um, planning. Um, there's a lot in the press about the planning system being dysfunctional. How do you see it currently for your sort of development and how do you see it evolving? Um, so as I say, that that was a, I'd already sort of started that segue into that question. Um, it's a very good question. I mean, it is, uh, planning is, uh, is, is, is very bureaucratic and uh, it's highly inefficient across the UK. And therefore, if you have a track record of securing planning on a fairly regular basis, then I think that is a real source of competitive advantage. And it's something which WJ has a good track record with. Um, and um, I flagged a couple of possible reasons for that earlier. And I, I, I think it does mean that we have confidence about continuing to convert land into consented schemes. And, you know, when you have land and you put a planning application in, it's, it's, it's an aspiration to have to be able to monetize it. But once you have your planning permission, then you can monetize it. So it's a really important gateway for any developer. And as I say, we do have we do have a good a good track record there. Um, Sarah, I'm going to raise a question with you that's coming about subcontractors and costs and things like that. So the question is, how much pressure is there on your subcontractors? And does this throw out your cost assumptions? Hi, Richard. I just think we've just lost um, Sarah there. So let me just uh, bring her back through, if that's OK, sir. That's OK. And I'll, I'll pick up this question just while you're doing that. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, yes, I, I, it's interesting. Um, just like all markets, as they evolve, uh, there are some important changes and pressures and things. And just like there is on global supply chains at the moment in every single sector and industry, Yes, there is pressure on the subcontractors and their supply chain, and it is one to be monitored quite closely. We are, I mean, effectively, I think, I think the narrative behind this, and it's quite, it's quite an obvious one, is that a lot of construction work takes a year or two, and therefore there are a number of contractors who secured work perhaps just pre this marked inflation last year, and potentially therefore the actual margins they're making are significantly lower than they thought they would but i guess they were trading through fine because they would they assume their order book would be very strong for this year and potentially next year and potentially also not just a strong order book but perhaps a high margin order book as well because of the rate of inflation and clearly what is happening now is that not only is the order book getting smaller because construction activity in the UK is is reducing pretty sharply, but also, uh, as we set out, the bill cost inflation is coming down quite quickly. It, it could well go negative for materials. Uh, that would then put pressure on their margins. So I think there is definitely a risk of heightened distress. Uh, but as I say, it, it, it's probably no different to any other part of supply chain, and, and, and I'm positive it's being experienced globally. It is one to be managed very closely is one to watch for quite closely. I do think we have an advantage in that we are a main contractor as well. And therefore, we do have good visibility into supply chains, much more than your, your, your typical developer would have. Um, but it's a good question because I think there is, um, we, we need to be very, very, very vigilant in, in, in that sense. So. Sorry, Richard, just to say, um, Sarah's back on the line. Oh, perfect. Thank, thank you very much for the findings no worries, Sarah. Sir. So Sarah, I've, I've got a question for you, which I think could be our last question, just looking at the clock. Um, but, and I'll just read it straight out, but sorry if I've, if I missed it, but how can the contracted forward sales be lost? I, the two from end of the prior year. And if they can be lost, why should you investors be confident in the contracted sales level forecast for 22 and 23? 
Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Just to yes. check, yes. check them Perf Perfect. So if I, um, in terms of our contracted sales levels, as, as I said, that, that, that there are schemes that we've already forward sold. So we forward sold those in financial year 22. Um, we've got a, a contractually secure agreement with the purchaser. We are building those out on, on site. And obviously, we take the revenue and, and, and profit for those um, to the PL on a monthly basis. In terms of the two forward sales that they, they were they were delayed just at the point as though we were going to complete the forward sale and therefore we couldn't recognize any revenue um we haven't uh obviously done anything more with those but they are still very much part of that consented pipeline which we are working through the market with so we have those out in the market and obviously talking to a number of purchasers in relation so moving toward to, to then completed the forward for, forward sale on them so i think it's really to differentiate between what we do have secured where we have a, a contract and we are building out and the ones that we are looking to take into a uh, contract perfect Rick. Richard, so if I may just jump back in there and thank you very much indeed for addressing all of those questions that came in from investors this afternoon. And of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, we'll make these available to you uh, immediately after the presentation has ended. Uh, just for you to review to then add any additional responses, of course, where it's appropriate to do so. Um, Richard, just before redirecting those on the call to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with, that'd be great. Well, I'm simply going to say th thank you very much uh, for your time this afternoon. Uh, it is it, it is it is really useful getting direct um, feedback and interaction with all investors, not just some of the largest institutional holders on, on the register. So this is this has been particularly useful, and to get to get a, a lot of Q and A into the nitty gritty of the business, I, I found um, really interesting. So um, on behalf of myself and Sarah, um, a very big thank you. Richard, that's great. And Sarah as well, thank you once again for updating investors this afternoon. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views uh, and expectations. This won't take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Watkin Jones PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session, so good afternoon to you all.